delighted to be here with all of you. This is just uh, Allison and Anne. Thank you so much for uh, doing this together. And thank you, Heather, for that beautiful introduction and Ron for all your work with Alaska Quarterly, which is such an important publication and one that has meant a lot to me uh, over the years and to so many readers and writers. And um, I'm going to start with a poem of mine that was published in the Alaska Quarterly. Oh, I should say, I am in Santa Cruz, California, and uh, this is the land of the Awaswas people, also known as the Santa Cruz people, a tribe of the Ohlone Nation. And um, it's a, a beautiful day here with a little rain, which we're so grateful for, every tiny bit of rain is just a blessing these days in Santa Cruz. This poem that was published uh, many years back in the Alaska Quarterly has nothing to do with Earth Day. So I'm gonna start with it and we'll just kind of um, then move on to earthier things. But I just wanted to acknowledge the Alaska Quarterly in this way. It's called Why People Murder. I found out why people murder in the kitchen of our house in Boulder Creek where we'd made soybean patties, dozens of soybean patties, ground up in our Vitamix blender and stacked in saran wrap in the freezer. He was in the living room in navy blue sweatpants and sheepskin slippers and his pipe. He was tamping tobacco with his thumb and looking for matches. I picked up the knife we'd used to chop onions, onions and carrots and whatever else it was we put in those hopeful, dry little cakes. The details of this particular fight are lost, but trust me, they don't matter. Just imagine need, primitive, a baby screaming for the tit, lust, the clawing into another, wanting to part the other like water and be taken in, and desperation, that's the big one. You're shaky as a junkie, the pain hums an electric current, you're frozen to it, a dog who's gnawed on a cord and must be kicked off. Save me, I'm frantic, I'm on my knees prostrate, I'm flat as wax across the linoleum floor. The knife is clean, I washed it after the onions. I lurch into the living room, my breath comes out visible like in cold weather. When he sees me, he's startled, doesn't know if he should be scared. I'm emanating like a rod of uranium. He says my name, tentative. I look down at the knife as if I were carrying it to the drawer and took a wrong turn. This next poem is called Ode to the First Peach. And I, am, uh, I, I owe it to my wife who thinks I don't go outside enough and a couple of years back brought me into my office the the first peach from our peach tree and said here <laughs> write about this ode to the first peach only one insect has feasted here a clear stub of resin plugs the scar and the hollow where the stem was severed shines with juice the fur still silvered like a call even in the next minute, the hairs will darken, turn more golden in my palm. Heavier this flesh than you would imagine, like the sudden weight of a newborn. Oh, what a marriage of citron and blush. It could be a planet reflected through a hall of mirrors, or what a swan becomes when a fairy shoots it from the sky at dawn. At the beginning of the world, when the first dense pith was ravished and the stars were not yet lustrous coins fallen from the pockets of night, who could have dreamed this would be carried from the chaos? Scent of morning and sugar, bruise and hunger, silent, swollen, clefted life, remnant always remaking itself out of that first flaming ripeness. This next poem um, 
is called The Big Picture and uh, it was included in an anthology that I wanna tell you about if you're not familiar with it. It's called All We Can Save, Truth, Courage and Solutions for the Climate Crisis, which is just a terrific anthology. If you feel despair, if you feel like, oh my God, you know, every time I think about the trouble we're in, I just am miserable and don't know how to cope with it. This book is so positive and really energizing and really reminds us that uh, all is not lost. Yes, it's, a, I mean, we know how bad it is. I don't need to tell you, but all is not lost and there's so many things we can do. And I was, I was really happy to have my poem included. And I just recommend this book really highly, All We Can Save, The Big Picture. I try to look at the big picture, the sun, ardent tongue, licking us like a mother besotted with her new cub will wear itself out. Everything is transitory. Think of the meteor that annihilated the dinosaurs, and before that, the volcanoes of the Permian period all those burnt ferns and reptiles, sharks and bony fish. That was extinction on a scale that makes our losses look like a bad day at the slots. And perhaps we're slated to ascend to some kind of intelligence that doesn't need bodies or clean water or even air. But I can't shake my longing for the last 600 Iberian lynx with their tufted ears. Brazilian guitar fish, the 4% of them still cruising the seafloor, eyes staring straight up. And all the newborn marsupials, red kangaroos, joeys the size of honeybees, steelhead trout, river dolphins, so many species of frogs breathing through their damp permeable membranes. Today on the bus, a woman in a sweater the exact shade of cardinals and her cardinal colored bra strap exposed on her pale shoulder makes me ache for those bright flashes in the snow. And polar bears, the cream and amber of their fur, the long hollow hairs through which sun slips swallowed into their dark skin. When I get home, my son has a headache and though he's almost grown, asks me to sing him a song. We lie together on the lumpy couch and I warble out the old show tunes, night and day, they can't take that away from me. A cheap silver chain shimmers across his throat, rising and falling with his pulse. There never was anything else, only these excruciatingly insignificant creatures we love. I had the good fortune to um, spend a week at the Andrews Experimental Forest in Southern Oregon. Some of you know of it, and it's a brilliant place in every way with, you know, trees that are hundreds and hundreds of years old and going hundreds and hundreds of feet up into the sky, old growth conifers, and they are uh, the, the people who created the Andrews and uh, continue with it, have the brilliant idea of connecting artists with scientists and see that a conversation between us all is a good idea, which is uh, so obvious, but not always, uh, not always obvious to everyone. But uh, they have these wonderful residencies and I loved my week there and I wrote this poem it's called Fungus on Fallen Alder at Lookout Creek. Florid, fluted, flowery petal, flounce of a girl's dress, ruffled fan, striped in what seems to my simple eye an excess of extravagance. Intricately ribboned like a secret code, a colorist's vision of DNA. At the outermost edge, a scallop of ivory then a tweedy russet 
thin mouse gray, a crescent of celadon velvet, a streak of sleek seal brown, a dark arc of copper, then butter, then celadon again, again butter, again copper, and on into the center, striped thinner and thinner to the green, green moss furry heart. How can this be necessary? Yet it grows and is making more of itself. Dozens and dozens of tiny starts, stars no bigger than a baby's thumbnail, all of them sucking one young dead tree on a gravel bank that will be washed away in the next flooding winter. But isn't the air here cool and wet and almost unbearably sweet? I have um, a couple of new poems that I'd like to read. This one I wrote after spending some time in Yellowstone recently. And uh, it's called Wild. I never saw the wolf, but I saw the antelope running, tan blurs rippling down the hill. In the Lamar Valley, willies and willows and aspen drenched in the gold and cadmium yellow of autumn. I joined the crowd on the side of the road, tripods balanced on the roofs of vans, scopes and binos articulating every flicker of blade and leaf, shimmer of fur. And I thought, okay, maybe this is what we get. Like with God or wind or the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, evidence still wild in the remnants of the planet, the wolf is there. And, um, this one I wrote uh, sometime after being there, after uh, hearing about this situation that I always hate when people tell you what the poem's about before they read the poem and then you really don't need to hear the poem. So I was just about to go and do that and I'm just gonna stop myself. It's called Fracture. When the grizzly cubs were caught, collared, and taken away, relocated, they call it, their mother ran back and forth on the road screaming to them, for them. Brutal sound, torn from her lungs. They don't write about this in the news, her heart, twisted knot, hot blood rivering to the 26 pounding bones of her feet. Just weeks before, I watched a bear and her cub run down a mountain in the twilight. So buoyant, they seemed to be tumbling to the meadow, to the yarrow root they dug, rocking to rest it from the hard ground, fattening for winter. They were breathing what looked like gladness. But that other mother, who will think about her? Her massive head raised, desperate to catch their scent, each footfall of her dreadful weight, a fracture in the earth's crust. And I'll end with this poem, it's called Still Life. It won't last, of course. The sun at just this angle on the coral tulips, even now they're spinning away, but oh, these open mouths reach out on their supple stems, revealing yellow throats, golden pistol, and black anthers wheeling. They ride the air, loose cups of emptiness, satin feathers, parrot-colored curtains. They billow, they plume, dreamy sails, slack bells. They lift and tremble at the slightest shift. Even my breath sets them nodding. For a minute, maybe two, they dwell and crest. Then the planet's stream takes them with it and the shallow pond of light is gone, except the tip of one petal still catching the sun. Thank you.